I am extremely excited today here to welcome a super special individual to the intersection at the intersex- intersection of technology and culture. Anitan is a three times best selling author who has spoken and written extensively about dating and relationships in the modern world. His best selling books include Burlesque about the etiquette of a contemporary gentleman, gentlewoman, Etiquette for a Lady, and The Gray about overall relationship etiquette study. Anitin is the co-founder and creative director of Flourish, the largest platform to shop and discover black-owned businesses, founder of a creative marketing agency, St. Miles. He's produced short films, been a private consultant, a keynote speaker at Stanford and Harvard, partnered on projects with Usher, even majored in computer science and went interned at <laughs> Hewlett Packard in Silicon Valley. <laughs> a taste you maker of Mary Trey. <laughs> yeah. Welcome, Anitin, to the intersection. My brother, thank you for having me, man. It's, it's been a minute since Chicago. Um, glad you made the connection, man. It's, it's funny to hear that introduction because as wild as you look at your life, the journey, you know, you hear it reverberated back to you. It's like, wow, man, I got a lot to go. I don't even really reflect on the past like that. So it was cool to hear that stuff. A lot of people say that funny enough. They're like, oh, it's weird that I hear my introduction to back to myself. Um, I'm really curious what relationship etiquette is, specifically the etiquette part, because I don't think I've ever heard that before. Yeah, it's just, it's well, etiquette is governing relationships, right? It's the rules to govern a relationship, right? How you go about doing things, the, what your approach so, I mean, a relationship, relationship etiquette is, is really kind of tongue in cheek. It's, it, you know, to have etiquette is to govern a relationship in general. And when you think about, you know, where things have gone as of the last 10 to 20 years with the advent of technology and how that suppressed the human emotion and almost kind of put it into this digital format. So it was like, where does etiquette fit in this new world and this new wave? And now you talk about like AI and, you know, humans becoming less and less <laughs> of a priority. It's like, we we need the rules that, that govern etiquette, right? Like we need to be able to, you know, know how to treat each other in any given circumstance. Do you think, you just touched on it, but that it's missing more in today's society, people kind of just free, free, uh, freestyle their relationships? I mean, we don't have a lot of, we don't have a lot of accessible examples, right? The examples that we have are digital again, right? And we have these thoughts about what we believe these relationships entail until you hear further down the line, oh, that's what was going on in the relationship. You know, where you hear this couple split up and you're like, damn, I thought it was all good. I think that, you know, we don't have enough visibility. I mean, you have platforms like Black Love, you have this resurgence of, of the, the necessity of love, right? Like I think in culture right now, we're at a time where we desire our needs. You know, typically we we need our desires, right? But I think we're finally in a time where we desire our needs. So you're having a gravitational pull back to love and, you know, um, relationships. And with that comes the governing of these relationships. Like how do you do relationship, right? We don't even know how to do friendships together. So like, how do we get into relationship? How do we get into covenant with, you know, somebody else romantically in a serious way. Like, what does that look like in 2023 and beyond? Mm. Speaking of that, it seems like you have a very cool, <clears throat> awesome relationship with your wife. Can you give yeah. any uh, advice to people for how to work at building a relationship like that that's very grounded in love and respect and stuff like that? Yeah, so then build yourself. <laughs> like, oh, utilize good. your relationship as a mirror to be able to, see yourself mm. it, your relationship reveals the true nature of who you are you can't hide in a relationship like not a marriage you're gonna you're gonna show eventually so every time i look at her i'm like okay i can see my flaws i can see my great areas i can see where i need improvement of course you know areas of growth and ultimately like i would advise you to you know couple up with somebody that's your friend like don't get with somebody that you mm. can't stand you know like don't base it off of <laughs> purely uh physicality the looks mm-hmm. you know what they got going on all that stuff fades my dad always used to tell me like everybody's gonna get old one day you know what i mean like the things that you thought were important you know eventually you're gonna fade and um physical beauty fades. so 
you know, my wife and I, you know, we're grounded in a friendship. We developed mm. and established our friendship foundationally first. For me, it wasn't by choice, but it was what was on the table. So that's what I took. And through her forcing me to be her friend, if I wanted any type of relationship, it established that ground level foundation so that when all else might try to corrode, it lands on this friendship. Like when it, right, when the center of our relationship is, is revealed, it's, it's, we're just, we're friends, we're really great, great friends. So we know how to kick it on a Friday. We know how to kick it on a Tuesday on the couch. We know how to laugh. We know how to vibe. We know how to like, you know, bring out the best in each other. We know how to motivate each other, inspire each other. We know each other's weaknesses and strengths. So we build on that. So it's a partnership, man, in real terms. Like we look at, it's no different in the way that you look at a business partnership. Mm. Somebody you can build with, right? Somebody that you can you can gain with, right? Somebody that teaches you and you teach to grow. You teach each other how to grow. And, you know, that's, they got your back. That's beautiful. Speaking, going off of what you just said, people have different opinions about working with their yeah. spouse or trying to start a business. <laughs> What's your opinion on all that? Man, you got to know your partner. You got to know yourself. You know what I mean? Like mm. my wife and I have tried to work together for so many different uh not even so many different things but like <laughs> i'm i'm not like that you know what i mean like I, i'm not the easiest to mm -hmm. it depends if i if i really you like am passionate and have a firm belief in your capabilities i'm gonna speak mm. to that in whatever way i need to speak to that i might not be speaking to you i might be speaking to your potential mm. right so i'm trying to bring that up out of you so like whether you know when she and i so we used to go to the gym together man she ain't like me in the gym Cause then, you know, like the, the way I would speak to myself is how I would speak to her. Like I'm aggressive. I'm like, there's this get it done mentality regardless. And I had to learn, you can't treat people how you expect to be treated at all times. Right. Like there's a whole notion of like love languages and all that. I think my love language is all the love languages, but there's, there's, there's a way in which you have to love somebody specifically and you have to be attentive to who they are in order to love them specifically. So you can't base that off of, you know, how you like things done. So essentially, man, like you got to listen, you got to pay attention to your loved one. And um, when it comes to partners working together, like if you all can handle the truth delivered in any type of fashion, because they say business isn't personal, right? If you can handle that, if you have the skin for that, if you're not um, super sensitive and, and you take criticism well and, um, if you were patient, you know what I mean? And understanding and empathetic, it requires so much. It really, as I'm talking, it requires the same thing a relationship requires. You know what I mean? But um, there's this there's this emotion taken out of business a lot of times. Hmm. Um, so I think that's where the conflict can arise because how I, you know, how I might treat my wife tenderly like a little flower, you know what I'm saying? Like a, like a beautiful flower with a strong stem, a strong neck, strong back, strong spine. Um, I might wither that flower away in business. Mm. Good point. So it just I depends. Love mm -hmm. It depends. You have to know yourself. <laughs> no, that's a really good point. That if you want to have a great relationship with somebody else, you got to build yourself. You got to know yourself. You got to be the kind of person that somebody you would want to be with would be excited to be with. That's very cool. I love that. Um, Tell us more about Flourish. How did that get started? What was the insight you had to start it? What does that work look like today? Man, I mean, in just a year, well, first of all, there have always been, you know, like lists, long lists of and directories of black businesses. If you were in search of a dope product or dope brand to support or beyond support to just participate in culturally. Mm. And, you know, it was that or scrolling through IG's explore page you know what I mean? And, and finding the fashion and getting the algorithm to be like, okay, you like this, showing you that stuff, tr hoping they tag it. Is this this convoluted process or you're out in public? Me, for instance, I'm at a festival. I see somebody with some dope gear on. I'm at CultureCon. I see somebody with some dope gear on. I'm going to pull up on them and say, where'd you get that? Mm. To bypass that in strenuous, crazy process, especially for somebody who's grown up you know, supporting black brands, you know, everything I, I, I wear without effort is black owned brand, all the that's art so in, in my house, the books, you know, it's just collectively, that's, that's, we're, we're putting ourselves and our greatness on display. 
for ourselves and for our, our children to see and uh, to live in. And I want the same for for everyone. And there's a lot of people that want the same for themselves, but there was just nowhere to get it. So um, my, my co-founder, Steve Canal and I created the, a platform at the time in 2020, what are we in 23, 2022 last year, um, you know, it's, we're just barely a year and some change old, like a year and a half old, January 17th, 2022, and have already become the largest platform to shop and discover black owned brands all in one place, oh, wow. right? With this, with this, with a seamless, uh, user interface, you know, a, a, an easy process, easy discovery process. We storytell our brands, uh, every founder that comes on the platform, you know, we have a conversation with them. We interview them. It's called the flourish cool. five, five minute interview to get to know the brands. You know, there's the e-commerce portion, you know, which we have about 300 brands on the platform and over six to 7,000 products and growing and, you know, about 2,500, 3,000 people in on the wait list to get on the platform as far as brands who've applied. So, you know, it's growing tremendously. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> we just did a, you know, activated a, a conference in Orlando with TD Jake's Good Soil Conference, 2000 plus people, uh, 30 of our brands, you know, showed up and one of the brands ended up winning a hundred thousand dollar grant, um, at the event Dungeon Forward. Oh, wow. And so we're providing our brands with, you know, discovery and opportunities for growth. You know, our mission is to foster the discovery and growth of black owned brands. So, you know, we're leveraging our relationships, our personal relationships and our personal network, and we're pouring it into this machine that is flourish, right? And since we've turned this machine on, you know, we have a partnership with the Shade Room where we built their empowered, oh. <laughs> yeah, their e-commerce shop, the Shade Room shop. So it's the first time that they're, you know, selling product against their audience and, and, and allowing their audience to have access to this discovery and growth of black owned brands. And they just take a curated, list of brands that we have from our platform and they, they um, present them to their audience. So we've been building, you know, partnerships, sites, publisher sites through media, large media conglomerates, Shade Room 40 million um, across all platforms. And we've been putting our brands on these platforms, right, on display to be seen and, and to tell their story and have their products, you know, visible and their brand visible. You got to think like, as long as we've been in a relationship, it's been about seven million in, in advertising dollars that, you know, has gone towards supporting these black owned brands. Um, so, you know, it's we do in real life events. You know, as I mentioned, we got uh, homecoming, fam, you homecoming coming up. We're doing cans. We just did South by Southwest, you know, twenty five thousand people over over a few days. Um, oh, wow. It's 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 growing. The demand is there. Uh, we have really, really dope partners, you know, partnership with Shopify, who's helping us wow. elevate a million black brands and um, a ton of ton of really cool partnerships out there and some really cool uh, partnerships being established. But the point is the demand is there and the service is there and we're young and us getting, you know, making ourselves available um, you know, on every platform, just to scream out, flourish, flourish, flourish. That's the goal. We need everybody to know that we exist, right? You don't have to search far or do too much work. Hit flourish.com and see what's happening. Go to flourish.com and see what's happening. Yeah. How do you think we can all support and make black owned businesses more visible? And do you think that people, all people of all races in America specifically, like have a responsibility to support the economic empowerment of black people, maybe more geared white people specifically. Yeah. I mean, you know, in order to support support, you know what I mean? Like if you're in a corporate uh, setting, if you have a corporate position and you have access right to those dollars, release those dollars, right? There's initiatives, there's DEI initiatives, you know, seek who's out there, right? Get with the right people make sure that it's not just, uh, you know, you dishing money actually be invested, you know, in, like vested in the interest of the brand and, the, and seeing them do well, seeing them flourish. It's not just, you know, a lot of companies sometimes just cut a check. That's not enough. That's not sustainable. You know, we're looking for relationships mm. and access. Mm -hmm. um, if you're, if you're a consumer, right? Like, you know, before you go to another website, <laughs> Check Flourish first, right? We have a little bit of everything, right? We cover all categories, uh, food and beverage, home home goods, you know, furniture, apparel, accessories, beauty, 
um, skincare, even pet, you know, toys and games, art. So we, we cover all categories and it's in an elevated way. So if you think about it, you know, America already consumes black culture, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's all scattered, whether it's music, whether it's um, film, whether it's art, whether it's sports, whether it's entertainment, whether it's politics, whatever it is, um, America consumes black culture. And, you know, we are, we're building an, an ecosystem, the largest ecosystem that houses that, that culture, right? So you know exactly where those dollars are going. I think a lot of times people get caught up in founder this and founder that, but a founder is just you and me. <laughs> right. You know what I right. mean? Like founders have faces and families and, and friends and um, it's not just like this big, shiny, you know, business person on, on Inc. Right. Magazine. It's, 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 it's everyday people with, with real life issues. So those dollars circulated through that community only empower us to create more cool-ish also, by the way, you can say whatever you want on this podcast. It's unhinged. Um, oh, man, we all good, brother. <laughs> <laughs> you had a really cool quote. You said, when you give to the culture, the culture gives back to you. Can 100%. you uh, tell us more about that? I mean, that's anything. The law of reciprocity, man. Like, <laughs> what you plant with any seed planted in good soil is going to flourish, right? Like, you're going to get what you came for. So, I think it's... Um, you know, it's less about the notion of, you know, competition. It's more about collaboration. You know, cultures converge to community these days. People don't really use culture too much anymore. Everyone's talking about community, you know, mm. and people are talking about cooperation and, and, and less about competition. Um, I think that's, you know, those old ways are, are, are gone, you know, like it, it's, I think 2020 really was a watershed moment where everybody just kind of came to terms with some truths, some some uh, some maybe hard to swallow truths, and had to confront reality, had to confront truth, and um, you know a lot of our practices were toxic that we've been taught, my generation in particular, gatekeeping and all that. You mm. know what I'm saying? Like I got it, it's mine. You got to get your own. Pull up your bootstraps. Like Chicago not, was very not, much like that, unfortunately. Yeah, but I see a shift there as well. You know what I mean? I see people who are mm. shifting that that narrative. Kendall Hearns, who's really dope in the arts arts community and really bringing super dope artists together, mm. like Nico Washington and um, yeah, shout out Nico. You know, be more and um, you know Hebrew supporting like Kayla Mahaffey, Mahaffey. Um, Dovey Golden, like there's a gang of uh, Esteban Whiteside, a gang of dope artists out there that are, you know, I think changing that narrative. Um, I'd be surprised if within the next, because I think, you know, Chicago is the art capital of, of America. And really? I would be surprised. Oh, no, by far. Yeah, no doubt. One of my gifts is clarity. I see things others can't. <laughs> ah, you got the insight. <laughs> oh, yeah, nice. absolutely. Absolutely. And I I thought that for some time, but I've just been able to frame it properly. It's the art capital of America. That's where, that's where all of the like most incredible influences on art, they happen there. They mm. bubble there. They're from there. That's what Nate Jones was saying when he was on here, that he thinks in the next five to ten years, Chicago was going to flourish within the art and uh, economic sector like that it, in a new kind of way. Yeah, shout out to Nate Jones, my brother. He knows what he's talking about. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's it, we were out there in Chicago together. Like last when I saw you, yeah. Um, you know, we we were with uh, Don C and Jason um, Ma. Jason, yeah, Jason Ma, and really had a a really unique conversation on the observation of Chicago. And um, there's some some history there. There's documentaries, you know, that I can't remember the name of the doc, but it was very insightful in terms of the rich Chicago history as far as the advertisement industry and why it became the hub for advertisement and who impacted that. And, um, you know, the, the way the city was built, the architecture, the landscape, how it all impacts this. Uh, and, you know, the architecture is incredible, how it all impacts like this, this narrative that I believe for some time that it's the art capital of America. Everything happens there. Very cool. Well, shout out to Landon. Right now, I'm actually in the Chicago Drive Capital office. He's only 25 years old. And, uh, Yo, oh, you know Landon? 
I don't, but I'm saying that's incredible, oh. man. <laughs> they, they um they gave him and me me being 22, I kind of see this wave of new Chicago young people who are really trying to change the narrative of the gatekeeping and that's what I'm Landon saying. being 25, he got the authority to deploy $80 million of capital into early stage Chicago startups. So he's trying to go against the grain of the risk averse thing that Chicago has going on for a while and throw it into like, like where you're from in the near the Bay Area and do some more early stage stuff. Nah, man, that's what I I mean. I was happy to to be at the um, the tech conference last year because, you know, it, it, I think that we need to see more of that there. Again, if you if you supply this talent, this group of talented people with the tools and the resources and the access, that's the only missing component. You know what I mean? That's what we see with Flourish. There's all of these really dope founders, right? These creative folks who create businesses, but they don't necessarily know how to, they're going to hit a wall. They don't have the systems in place. They don't have the information. They don't have the resources to scale to pass the wall that they're going to hit. So, Hopping into the machine of flourish allows you to literally flourish to bypass and, and skip the line and get through that wall, get through that ceiling so that you now have exposure. I mean, one of the brands that um, the aware brand that, you know, is on our platform, you know, we recommended them to create the merchandise for the Good Soil Conference. Right. So one day it was 2000 people and for the next three days is over 20,000 people. Right. That they were serving, that they had an opportunity to, to uh, create merchandise and brand for. So their brand got a huge lift in, in um, business and visibility and a large stage overnight. You know, like they had no idea they were in the running. We were thinking about them, but we literally are, are providing our, our brands with these opportunities. And just like Chicago, like, you know where the talent is, man. You're in it. You're 22 years old. Like you're young. You, you're in the mix. Like you feel and see all the vibrations. You create in that wave. Every time you step, like you're creating that, that wave that eventually echoes out to the rest of the world. But, you know, Mm -hmm. it's important that y'all are served with those resources and opportunities. You know what I'm saying? Like the reason I'm doing this interview, like I was saw you in Chicago, you had that, that get up about you. You weren't, you just pulled up like, yo, I'm (laughs) such and such. It's what I got going on. What do you do? What's your name? What's it like that? That's that energy that, that, you know, it's that DJ Khaled energy. You know what I'm saying? Like, (laughs) like you're going to get to it. Like there is no way you ain't going to get where you're going, you know, with that type of, with that type of energy. Like, thank you. No for you ain't gonna take no for an answer. You see where you're going and you're gonna get there. It's just a matter of putting the pieces together. So, um, you know, we support we support cats that are that are that are putting it together, man, putting the pieces together. It's all one we're all one yeah collaborative, you know, uh entity, right? Like just doing trying to do the right thing and build, man. Build for the future. So, you know, we support it uplift each other and create the future that we want yeah i love people who have that mindset um yeah how did your journey as an author and a and a writer begin and what was it about writing that drew you man it it, it began before i knew it i mean my name anytime means someone with a story to tell in hmm. lagos yeah in, in the yoruba language yoruba nice yeah um my dad's nigerian so you know Every time my name is called, I respond to that call. So I've been responding to the call of telling stories all of my life. Anytime somebody says my name, and it wasn't until a mentor of mine, and you know, I was about twenty, early twenties, suggested like, "Yo, I think you should write a book," which I thought was super crazy at the time because I had no interest in it, no desire to do it. I didn't write in my free time. You know what I mean? Like I was mm-hmm. very good with words because my mom was a I, you know, a speech pathologist. So she would come home and mm. just give us aptitude tests and stuff like that um, before she retired. And my dad was just a, a linguist, like, you know, like wow. he's just, yeah, he's, he's dapper with the words. Um, so it was just natural. And we would get, you know, A's on our English tests. It was easy because it, it was just what we knew was second nature. We would get A's in English class, like physical education, like PE. Um, but it wasn't really until, you know, my mentor inspired me to write it that I that I took that leap and I learned how to write. You know, I learned how to talk, how to write like I talk. You know, when hmm. I would talk to girls in college and pop at them with all my slick talk, I learned how to like tap into <laughs> writing and, and you know, make my, my my hands do the same thing as my brain without any interruption. Like I learned how to flow. And um 
it was always it's just been well received since you know what i mean like writing is a toolkit you can it's a way to express yourself in the same way fashion is or any mm. other thing so i like to play with it you know words are malleable you can do so many things with them mm. um and I'm I'm a fan of words, man. They get you from point A to B. I mean, words change my life. <laughs> you know, telling stories change my life, and um, I'll always do that. You know, even though I'm currently creative director and co-founder with Flourish, you know, it's it's a storytelling engine as well. So we're telling mm-hmm. those stories. You know, um, some of my other businesses, you know, we're still we're still telling stories. You know, I write every day. It just may oh, wow. not be yeah, it may not be public, but you know, my phone is full of thousands and thousands and thousands of notes and several wow. books and, you know, songs and films and documentaries and incredible ideas, you know, dating back to 2008. So it's all there. Hmm. Speaking of dapper, you used the word dapper a few moments ago. How'd you get so fresh anytime? You're a very hey, fly guy. Look at you. Hey man, I appreciate that. And I just threw this on to tell you the truth. I just kind of had it on all day. This this blazer was stuck in a hotel in San Francisco and uh, my wife, she sometimes she wore my clothes. She had it on and she left it in the hotel back in February and they just sent it to me. <laughs> so I was just like, let me throw it. I miss it. Let me throw it on. It just happened to. Even Dapper Dan said you got a nice style. I was like, wow. Yeah, he's got, he's got great taste. <laughs> he's got great taste, man. I mean, that goes without saying, you know, that brother's been doing it for a long time and is a legend in this. And uh, yeah, to be acknowledged, recognized by that brother. You know, that's uh speaks for itself. You've said that you like people watching at the airport. Favorite. I also like people watching at the airport. What is it about that? Because, man, in what other world do you have this moment in time where you're able to see a collection of humanity? You know what I mean? Like mm. from all walks of life, from the little literally six week old kid to the 96 or 106 year old person being wheeled down the you know, the lane. And then it's all these different cultures and all these perspectives and all kinds of stories, man. Like you could just walk by. So you could just sit there, observe people and in your mind, tell their stories, right? Like, I wonder what this is. That's what I do. I'm a storyteller. I'm able to like tap into them and like maybe sort of kind of imagine what their life might be like. You know what I'm saying? So it's also this interesting practice and empathy because if I hit the target right, and what I believe their story might be, then I'm able to kind of step into their shoes. And, you know, it's, 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 I also believe it's no coincidence. Um, I don't believe in coincidences. So I believe every time is an appointed time. It was, it was predestined. It was written. So anytime you're anywhere, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. And whoever's in that vicinity with you is going to impact your life in some way. So every time you're in the airport and all these people are passing and all these faces and all this, you might be, you, you know how something's going to inspire you. You might see a kid that sparks something in your mind. It's like, man, I remember childhood and it takes you back to your childhood. which like you end up healing something in yourself in the airport or you might be like, you know what, babe, I'm headed home. And you might give her a baby because you're thinking about babies. And now you have your first child because something inspired, some little kid inspired you in the airport or somebody walking by with some dope fashion that, you know, kind of shifts your perspective and style or um, somebody having a conversation or, or traveling and rushing to see their significant other and you don't have one and it kind of takes you down that 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 mindset. So it's just a, a not a cesspool, but a, like a, a garden of uh, opportunity in, in life and humanity, man, it's, that you get to like witness in real time and passing. Um, and you can just you can be present enough to capture you know, what they might be going through in life. And that's a, that's a magnificent thing to experience. You, uh, you, you've been one to champion conversations around therapy and mental health, where you've mentioned that historically in the black community, it hasn't been talked about as much. And so how do you think people, um, what, what do you see for like a future where people are fully comfortable with embracing these things? Man, freedom, man. You know what I mean? Like, imagine being free. I mean, you are, but you got you got to like accept it. Yeah, it's a it's an accepting thing because your your physical experience will tell you that you're not. You know, but it's 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 a spiritual thing. You know, like we are free. We just have to stop paying for something. We gotta stop like paying for something that, that that's already been paid for. You know what I mean? Like, 
imagine a healed version of yourself. You show up entirely differently, right? You're informed. Everything you're informed by is usually impacted by your trauma. So there's this filter of trauma and then there's you. So in between you and how you present is trauma. And then there's how you present to the world, right? So when you remove that lens, it's a totally, it's a totally different person. You're no longer bitter. You're no longer angry. You're no longer devastated. Your posture shifts, right? You're no longer um, afraid. All of the things that hold you back, there's no longer any barriers. You're legitimately in alignment with who you are, who you've been called to be. There's something very powerful about that. It means you're going to do which exactly what, what you were put on this earth to do, right? So if you have everybody that's doing exactly what they're on this earth to do, and they're doing it from a place of freedom, they're doing it from, a, from uh, an abundance mindset and not a scarcity mindset, it shifts everything. There's longer life. There's, there's life lived well. Disease is is not a thing, right? Because what is disease? It's dis ease. Dis ease, right? yep. It's yep. it's yep. it's dis ease that goes unaddressed and it it coagulates, right? And it it impacts your cells, you know what I mean? They begin to mutate and um your body breaks down, you know, it gets out of whack because it's uneasy. You're tense, you know. Imagine a day that, that you're relaxed, that your body's not all you know, sometimes like I remember I I just adjust my posture and be like, damn, was I that tense? You know what I mean? Like, I, re- I relax my shoulders and like, they drop so low. I was like, was I, why was I tense? I'm just, I'm just chilling at the crib. Why am I, why am I so, you know what I mean? Why is, why is my natural disposition defense? Right? So I think that um, a hill person is a whole person and the whole people, man, they make this whole world, you know, and make it flourish in a beautiful way, right? Like, there would be no, everything would be eradicated. That's what peace looks like. Beautiful. I know we're running up on time here. Uh, you, you're, you're big on being self-sufficient. And you've learned a lot of skills being fully self-sufficient. You said since you were 12, you learned how to cut your own hair and, quote, messed up cutting my hair for years just so I didn't have to go to the barber. So yeah. I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I was an interesting <laughs> kid, man. You know, I mean, I don't, I, I don't believe in, I believe in interdependence. You know, I believe we have to be connected. We're, uh, you know, uh, independent. We are, there's nothing we can do independently, truly. Um, we're all, uh, you know, uh, a resource connected to a source, you know. So, um, but in terms of like, being willing to go at it alone, you know, you and God, I believe in that, um, that willingness to always do that. Cause that means that you're always going to give and get what you came for, you know, despite any type of, um, infraction, mountain, hill, you know, barrier, you're always going to get to it because you believe in you and God, you know what I mean? And, and, and when you prove yourself to yourself, it's something powerful because then you no longer have to do that again. You know, like, it's one thing to prove yourself to yourself, but that's not sustainable. You know, once you understand who you are, the mission is different and you're no longer worried about competitors or or naysayers. Um, You're willing to go at it alone and the results end up looking like, you know, cutting your hair at 12. Because you say to, I said to myself, like, man, the barbershop's cool, but they'd be cracking too much. You know, they'd be clowning and, you know, like, it (laughs) it takes a long time. (laughs) I mean, it's cool, but like, you know what I'm saying? I'm a different kid. They play. And then plus, it takes so long, right? It takes like how much time? You got to get in the car. You got to go to the thing. It's like a, it's a, it's like a ceremony, man. Like you got to do it. It's like a whole, you got to make an appointment. And man, I just get up and, you know, like at any given point, I'm, I, could, I know exactly how to do my clippers, my bevel clippers. You know, they're portable. So I can take those joints anywhere I want to go and, and, and get it done. And I got the trimmers, the trimmer and clippers in one. So you can do the whole thing, you know, on the go. And I ain't been in the barbershop in like like two, two maybe three decades. Wow. You know, that's not to brag about because I support <laughs> local business and, and barbers, mm-hmm, black barbers. Mm-hmm. But I appreciate those that money I saved as well. And I, I took that same narrative and concept 
I kind of apply it to everything, you know, like I figured out how to do a lot without any training. I figured out how to play, you know, keyboard, drums, uh, piano, guitar, um, cut hair, you know, draw, do art, um, creative, all the creative things I do, write, uh, the design work that I do. I'm a creative director. I learned Photoshop. I learned um, the whole Adobe suite. You know, I learned coding. I learned all these things on my own, man. Um, so when I, I say self-sufficient, I mean, like, be willing to go to, to get to it. Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. try. Just try. And I realized at, at one point I didn't know that that was a gift, my ability to um, go after a goal and, and get to it um, if I had no business in that field. You know, and I thought, like, I would get frustrated with people and I'd say, like, why don't you just try? I promise if you try, you'll be able to figure it out. Because that was, that was my mm -hmm, formula. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize I had a gift, right? There's, there's, there's actually a gift that I have to do all of these different things well at a high level. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it, it informed me that, hey, man, at any given point, like, if I decide to pivot and do something new, which I've done several times, I don't, I don't fear it. I know I'm going to figure it out. That's a fantastic point because a lot of the time when I don't end up learning something, it's not because I was necessarily bad at it. I just assumed it would be difficult before even giving myself the chance to try giving it a serious attempt. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, nowadays there's technology to, to take place of some of this, some of this stuff. <laughs> All the AI stuff. <laughs> yeah, man. But, um, you know, you can never, you can never mimic that, that spirit, man. Mm. can't mimic that spirit AI, AI can't account for that spirit man <laughs> AI has no well, spirit thank you so much for joining me today if there's anything else you want to plug any last words of wisdom or anything you'd want to conclude with in particular the floor is yours yeah man you know flourish 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 go to flourish check out flourish F with us at flourish and Beyond that, um, yo, it's going to be difficult. You know what I mean? Like, the journey is difficult. Um, yesterday, seven-figure deal fell through the cracks. You know what I mean? Oh, man. Um, that we've been probably working on for like seven, eight months. And I said to myself, I felt it for a second, and then I said to myself, it's good to lose this deal, and I'll eventually get what's, you know, we'll get what's ours, but because it shows that it signals that I'm, st I'm on the journey, right? If I'm not losing these type of deals, that means I'm complacent, I'm comfortable, um, I'm not where I, where I want to be, right? The work isn't matching up. You got it. This is part of the process on the journey. You have to lose deals in order to get deals, right? Like it's just, <laughs> but these deals, these numbers are going to continue to increase. So it just reveals to me where I am, you know, at this point, which is, which is good. I mean, there's more on the table. This isn't the only one. And you know, just know that like, it's difficult if you do, but it's difficult if you don't. I feel like it's harder if you don't, right? Like I can deal with failure because it's, it's really just a bunch of lessons and opportunity, but regret is a different type of thing. Like to not do something that you could have done because you were afraid or because of whatever hinders you, um, you gotta, you gotta know that it's gonna be difficult. You know, there's gonna be peaks and valleys and that doesn't determine who you are at any given point. You just got to keep going. And the inevitability of consistency is you're going to get where you're going. And speaking of going, uh, I got to go to my son's football practice. He <laughs> is in the championship game on Saturday. So uh, wish him well. Flag football, seven years old. He's the fastest kid out there. Um, go Miles. Go Miles. Good luck, Miles. And good luck anytime on whatever you need it for. Thank you so much for joining me today. My brother, Matt, thank you for having me, man. I appreciate you.